Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome again to Finding Me in the ITV Networks. Today with me a very extraordinary man, an extraordinary professor and an extraordinary human being. And this is Henning Melba. He is part of the Nordic Africa Institute. He's an extraordinary professor in the Department of Political Sciences at the University of Pretoria. And as he has often said, he's a troublemaker. So with that, I'd like to say welcome and thank you very much for being here. Thank Henning. you, Kurasha, for having me. You know, Henning, from the time I've met you, I've always been inspired by the things that you've said, by the way you engage, but more importantly, just by the way you exude your humanity. It's, you know, when you engage with somebody, it's, it's, that's the time you can judge a person and you can see the extra, that's why I call it an extraordinary human being. You see those qualities that come to the front. Now, you have been part of a very extraordinary foundation also, and that's the Dach Hammarskjöld Foundation. Um, it was about a Swedish diplomat, the second Secretary General of the United Nations. What made you go into this foundation, and what, you found, what did you find inspirational about this particular foundation and this particular man? Well, first of all, let me thank you. This is a very extraordinary recognition, which you started with. I uh, find it very moving and touching because it might be at the core of our subject. If we are not behaving like true human beings with empathy, with respect for otherness, with recognition of a variety of interests, how are we then going to make this world a better place? So in that sense, what you just started <laughs> with is very heartwarming to me because more than any, let's say, formal, academic, whatever criteria, I think should count in our lives how we interact as human beings. So I'm really touched. I very late started to engage with Doc Hammarskjöld and his values and ethics. I had a much longer story before in anti-colonial struggles, then being confronted with what I call the limits to liberation, where I felt the comrades are not living up to the experiences. They are actually betraying the struggle. Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth got a completely new meaning for me after independence in Namibia, where I lived and where I was exiled and returned. And it was very frustrating to realize that our dreams did not really turn into realities that we did not live up to the promises, not to the expectations, that the poor remained poor and that we have a new elite joining ranks with an old elite, which I would call a transition to new inequalities. And it very much applies to South Africa. It applies to most other societies who were in transition. So under those circumstances, I ended up as a research director for the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala. That was in the year 2000. And I started to work on the limits to liberation. And it didn't dawn on me then that I wouldn't end up as the executive director of the Dark Hammarskjöld Foundation, which happens to be in the same city of Uppsala, mm -hmm. 80 kilometers away from the Swedish capital, Stockholm, where Dark Hammarskjöld also was raised and is buried. But six years into the job as a research director, the Doc Hammarskjöld Foundation was looking for a new executive. And much to my surprise, they approached me and asked if I would not be willing to consider applying. And by that time, I already had discovered Doc Hammarskjöld as one of my role models, next to maybe one other who is as much a role model, that is Albert Camus. And both share actually something which I would, re would call civil courage, mm -hmm. fundamental ethics that transcend the limits of political ideology. By that time, I was in my mid-50s. Wow. I'm okay. as old as I look. <laughs> and by that time, I had painfully so discovered that political ideology 
is not necessarily the decisive element. That brings me back to the human interactions. I came across a lot of people I much dislike, despite their political affinity to my own political ideas, but their way they behaved. Authoritarian, narrow-minded, exclusivist, not gender sensitive, not sensitive to other identities. Sexual identities would be a point. So political ideology, I realized, was not the ultimate defining criterion. And Dark Hammarskjöld came from a very conservative, traditional Swedish family. But he was always loyal to much more profound, ultimate ethics and values. He never compromised on human dignity. He never compromised on human rights. And he was one of those persons where I realized that there are more decisive values than political ideology one should relate to. I hope there's still a little bit of an affinity that those who are close to my own political ideology also promote more those profound values I treasure. So, yeah. Just to say there are a lot of assholes in the midst of our <laughs> political activism. That is true. And, and you know, confronting those is a huge challenge on a daily basis because you find that people write academically but do not practice what they write. And, and it's a huge difference between preaching and practicing. I think especially amongst academics as well, and that's why we find this, um, I think there's a gap in terms of the academics that sit in the ivory towers and what's actually happening in the society. This, you know, this misunderstanding or maybe this lack of understanding totally of who you're supposed to be writing for or what you're supposed to be contributing. Absolutely, and that brings me back to my own student days, which go more than 40 years back in history. It was this student movement of the early 70s. I studied in West Berlin. It was a very leftist movement, but very much uh, internally divided. We had at least eight, nine, ten different leftist student groups, each fighting the other one more than the reactionaries, as if world revolution starts by eliminating the others who you should join an alliance with. And where you had this obsession with political correctness in a very destructive way, and where you had people who on that move became professors and behaved actually much more authoritarian then in eliminating others who had dissenting views than those who were politically on the other side. And that was a very sobering experience already when I was in my 20s to realize that political conviction alone does not actually guide you to behave like a truly human being. I joined a men's group then only to discover that every other man in that group was there because they were in troubles with their girlfriend. And I didn't have a girlfriend at the time. And I said, what am I doing here? I'm basically lost. It was a time where, in parallel, I started to compare sexism and racism. Uh, because I came from Namibia, I was exiled, I came across black consciousness in the early 1970s, had to realize that they were not against me. Onko Pozzetiro, who I met, he had to laugh when he was seeing that I was afraid of him. He said, I'm, I'm not fighting you. Um, so this, this was the melange then, where I realized, well, there is more to it than just lip service politically and pursuing a career on a leftist discourse. Um, there's much more to it. And I came across people who didn't share my political ideology and were much more human beings than many of those I would have considered as comrades. And do you find that this, this internal division, you know, it's like also a, a pecking order amongst the leftists or a pecking order amongst you know, black people or, or the colonial divide and rule kind of a system. Do you find that this particular internal divisions are what is actually tearing Europe apart also today in the resurfacing of the way in which the entire politics in Europe is playing out? Absolutely. Everywhere in the world. We are obsessed too much with our too narrow identities and consider them as the ultimate truth. There is no ultimate truth. 
unless you would say true humanity is the ultimate truth. But that would imply diversity. That would re re uh, imply respect for diversity. That would imply something that Rosa Luxemburg already said, that she said, I would most likely beg to differ with you, but I would always defend your right to say what you think. And that we tend to forget. It's the self-righteousness, it's the claim to that we are the torchbearers of emancipation, and that is actually already in itself the risk to violate true emancipation if we claim to be superior to others. I think we can only try to be claiming the moral high grounds if we are willing to accept that there is no superiority, that there is not a reliable kind of criteria how superiority should be defined. We should abstain from that. We should be much more uh, modest. Uh, yeah. OK, so we have to go to a break. When we come back, I want to, to encapsulate those things that you have just said and relate it again to ethics and ethics in the UN. And because that is perhaps where the Hammerschold, I suppose, shone out and, and maybe where you took a lot of the role models, uh, examples of his behavior from. So we'll see you after the break. بمديح الهادي تنتظم ضاءت بالمختار ظلم وحلاف مولده النغم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me in the ITB Networks today with my extraordinary guest, Professor Henning Melber. And Professor, before we went into the break, you were speaking about this kind of mentality, you know, that, that focuses on, on portraying itself as a superior, as the only correct way. Amongst us and the Muslims, you always joke, it's either my way or the highway, you know, that kind of mentality. And I think we find that it's playing out in all forms of life, living, community, politics, society today. But of significance is the way in which we are ruled by the so-called structures, and one of them is the UN. And Dag Hammarskjöld was the second Secretary General of the United States. Now you speak of him as a man of being of, of exceptional ethical values and standards, and who recognized human dignity and human equality, who stood up for human rights. But in 1952 and, and in those years, you know, there was a strong contradiction about the nature of human rights. And the foundation of human rights was essentially established to protect what came about to be understood was white life after the, the genocide and the Holocaust. So did Hammarskjöld realize the faulty foundations on which this particular value was built? And did he challenge it through his ethical understanding of what it was to inc incorporate into all of humanity, all of human beings, and not just white life? Maybe it's a very challenging question. Maybe I should start by sharing a true anecdote from Dark Hammarskjöld in a speech to students at Lund University in 1958. And he made this appeal to respect for otherness and plurality, which comes into the picture when we discuss human rights, universality, cultural relativism. And he gave the following example with which he ended the speech. He made reference to a high-ranking colleague in the United Nations. He didn't disclose his names. He came from the Near East. And he told his story that as a student, he grew up with the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, only to study in Oxford and to discover the translation by Fitzgerald of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, and appreciating and liking very much the English version of the Rubaiyat he grew up with. To finalize his studies and return and get fond again of the original version of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And Dark Hammarskjöld ended the story by saying, wouldn't it be nice if we end in a world where we are able and willing to appreciate both the version of the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam as well as 
the translation by Fitzgerald. And I think such a concrete example speaks completely to an approach where you say, what does reconciliation mean? What does recognition mean? It needs to be able to accept that we have different ways to live, different cultural backgrounds, while at the same time, which Da Kammerschold also said, a shared common platform of defined, absolute defined human rights, which are non-negotiable. And that is a challenge that remains until the very day, because it's very tempting for any given society to abuse the power of definition. Western societies are very quickly claiming the moral high grounds by saying these are the universal human rights. Yes, and then they don't practice Meanwhile, they have their Guantanamo base, they invade other countries, they kill on a mass scale, and they couldn't care less about violating human rights through war crimes, crimes against humanity, and all sorts of things. Not even ratifying the ICC, as the US or France would do. And then we have the others who made use of the Charter of Universal Human Rights as endorsed in the United Nations, rightly so, to fight for their own emancipation in anti-colonial struggles, only when coming into power, forgetting about it, yes. and accusing the same norms and values for being Eurocentric and imposed. That is what I call the Mugabe argument. Yes, and this is your, your I suppose, your great disappointment with many of the liberation movements in Africa and your own personal experience. Absolutely. Mugabe says the right things for the wrong reasons. He wrecks his finger to Western imperialism and says, who are you, George W. Bush Jr. and Tony Blair, to tell me and lecture me about human rights? He's right. But the consequences he draws is, don't accuse me if I violate human rights, you violate human rights. Now, two wrongs doesn't Don't make a right. Yeah, exactly. And that touches on the current discussion over the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Yes, it's flawed. Yes, it reflects asymmetric power structures in the world. But it tries to pursue the right things. It tries to prosecute war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. So pulling out of that responsibility is the wrong conclusion. You should strengthen it and you should enter an alliance of the willing and name and shame those who do not ratify the Rome Statutes and do not subscribe to the ICC, which by the way would not only be the Western imperialist countries, it includes Russia and it includes China. So that's not the we, they divide of the global south and the former anti-imperialist camp against European Western imperialism. It's much more fundamental than that. Those in power tend to abuse power. And those who want to have the rule of law should subscribe to those, those things because what are they afraid of? If they subscribe to the rule of law, they can be under the ICC jurisdiction because there's nothing for which they can be taken to court. And there should be no fear, actually. The fear comes in when you lose the legitimacy, isn't it? And let me maybe add a quote from Dr. Marshall, who once very early said, the UN is not created to bring us heaven on earth, but to prevent us from hell. And creating those conventions, those normative frameworks, offer us an instrument. Apartheid was declared a crime against humanity hmm. by the same United Nations. Nations. And it helped us in the solidarity movements to campaign for sanctions, even among the Western countries, against the apartheid regime. It came very handy. We welcomed it. So if we now dismiss the UN, well, I'm sorry to say you can't eat the cake and keep it, either or. And while I see all the limitations of the UN, and our commercial did, it provides a framework you can use. Dr. Kammerschel at times was accused for being Western. Yes, he had a Western background, but in today's jargon, he would be called anti-hegemonic. He stood up against the Western powers when they, in his view, violated the charter of the United Nations, because for him, the only valid reference point and normative framework 
was the Charter of the United Nations and all these conventions, the Human Rights Declaration we have since then, the social rights, the economic rights, and he always measured the behavior of states against the Charter and their obligations as signatories to the Charter of the United Nations. So he, in essence, he was, I suppose, balancing between ethics, morality, justice, and law. Sometimes we find that people just focus on the law, but the law might not be just, or it might not even be moral. Examples like how we have an apartheid law. And, and Hamskol managed to balance between all of those. That is one thing he achieved. And the other thing was that he was more general than secretary, while the United Nations constantly look for a secretary general who is more secretary than general. Okay, so now that you've said that, from Dag Hammarskjöld till now, are there any other exceptional secretary generals that you think the United Nations has had post Hammarskjöld? I think the only one who come, came very close to Dag Hammarskjöld was Putros Putros Kali. That's why he only managed to one stay term. one term in <laughs> office. Right. And that's maybe why some people ask for a fundamental reform, not only when it comes to the UN Security Council, which reflects the asymmetric power relations in our world, but also when it comes to the Secretary General. They strongly argue in favor of one term for a Secretary General only. Because like the US presidents or any others, if you have two terms, the first term mainly serves the purpose to be re-elected. Yes. That's not a good agenda. No. So if you, have, if you have instead a one-term secretary general for six or seven years, then they can afford to be maybe more loyal to the values that are vested in the UN Charter than they are when they are tiptoeing around controversial issues, just to be re-elected, and we can observe it over and over again. I've seen it in Secretary General Ban Ki-moon especially, I yes. think. So. Okay, so you, you mentioned right at the start something very interesting, and you said a re-reading, what you discovered from the liberation movements and, and that they were not living up to what their ideals were, especially once they took power, and that was a re-reading of Fanon's a Wretched of the Earth. But more importantly, what I see also in terms of the liberation movements, especially in terms of the ANC and the way it's materializing today, is as if uh, Fanon's prophecy of uh, you know, the uh, pitfalls of national consciousness has, has come to life, almost as if these people have never read Fanon, you know, and everything that he said they're going to do, they've done, and they're doing it. It's like mind-boggling. What did you find was the rereading for you in terms of Wretched of the Earth? Well, I would strongly recommend those who haven't read yet Fanon, they should uh, revisit the Wretched of the Earth and read the third chapter on the pitfalls of national consciousness, because and that comes in a very old saying of a famous Lord Acton in the, in the British Empire of the late 19th century who said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And Fanon simply translated that into the post-colonial situation of the early 1960s and the late 1950s with unfortunately a very prophetic view because if you reread it, it's almost like an anatomy of post-apartheid society in South Africa or in Namibia or in Zimbabwe. And that is the sad lesson from history, that those who were the victims all too easily can turn into perpetrators and they could not care less about the ordinary people once they are in power and want to harvest the fruits of liberation for only their own individual interests. So we're at the end now, and perhaps you'd like to leave us with a profound moment for you from the Dach Hammarskjöld Foundation, and, and of course from, from this amazing man who I think you've taken much of your ethics and your life values from. Well, let me maybe end with another quote, because we started with the individual challenges if you want to be faithful and loyal to true emancipation. And that means you have to start with yourself, yes. not with the others. And this is a permanent lifelong journey. And Dr. Hammarskjöld once said, the longest journey is the journey inside. Mm -hmm. Meaning you always have to hold in, to reflect what you're doing, why you are doing it, and where your flaws are. Uh, because unfortunately, we, we have to live accepting that we will never come to an end when it comes to our own flaws. Mm -hmm. We always have to try to reduce them.
And that's what they say, if you live in a glass house, don't throw stones as well. So you're constantly aware and within your own consciousness, taking stock of your own actions. And, and when we do that, perhaps we become better human beings, I think so also, because just as a prophetic uh, tradition, I, I remember the story of who we call Luqman salam, where he said, they asked him, how come you have such excellent character? And he said, because I always looked at people and when I saw something bad in them, I said, oh God, please do not let that bad character be inside of me, you know? And that's exactly what, yeah. what, what you just elaborated now. But thank you very much for these wonderful insights and for this amazing journey. And hopefully we'll speak to you again when you're visiting South Africa. That would be nice. I hope nobody has been bored. <laughs> no, definitely not. You have brought wisdom, much wisdom. Thank you very much, Thank Helen. You. And with that, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. مديح الهادي تنتظم ضاءت بال